I had a good friend that I run around with all the time, and he was a Mason. And I asked him one day, I said, uh, Mr. Suttle, what do you have to do to be a Mason? He said, just what you done. If you want a petition, I'll get you one. There you go. Those early days of the lodge, it was easy to believe a brother's masonry was a large part of his life. He probably walked or rode horseback for miles to attend the meetings. Membership was small, and brethren took turns in filling the, the chairs. Each brother was present at every communication, except in case of emergency. Each uh, fellow thought it was his duty to visit a sick brother, maybe to sit up with him or perform some task for the family. No brother missed another brother's funeral, and their ancient brothers were happy in doing those things. They were happy in building this lodge for us today and for generations yet unborn. They applied to the Grand Master for a dispensation, a group of Masons, that they want to start a new lodge at a certain point. Uh, the Grand Master, most likely, if he thinks they're well organized and can do it, judges them to be capable of starting a lodge, uh, he would issue them a dispensation. I'm Past Master Portland Lodge 326, also Past Master uh, Bethpage 521, where I hold plural membership with both lodges. Portland Lodge 326 was originally Fountainhead Lodge 326. Uh, it was chartered in 1867, and it was organized in the O.P. Butler's house. My name is Paula Shannon. I work here at the Portland Public Library in the Bailey Museum. In 1867, as far as we know, the Fountainhead Masonic Lodge number 326 uh, first met and was organized in a private home of Oliver uh, P. Butler. My name is Patrick uh, McGuire and I am a very well-known local historian and I've, I've taken an interest in history for most of my life. And I know today uh, the interest is in the formation of the Fountainhead uh, number 326 Masonic Lodge that began uh, in the Fountainhead community in 1867. We know that Oliver Porter Butler uh, was one that was principally uh, instrumental in the organization of the lodge and uh, we know that there's a house that still stands uh, there on the Butler Bridge Road. And then the lodge later moved to the Old Fountainhead and met over the Old Fountainhead Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Church South. I'm Johnny Denton Friedel. It appears that they organized in October, October the 8th, 1867. On October the 3rd, 1868, they entered, entered into a, an agreement with the Fountainhead Church, the uh, Method, Methodist Episcopal Church. The old meeting house, which was a Methodist church at the old Fountainhead Cemetery. They met at that large building until somewhere around the early 1900s. As things started moving toward the railroad, uh, everything was building up around the railroad, and they tried to decide whether they were going to move on into Fountainhead, where the depot was at Fountainhead, and so they had to decide whether they were going to meet there or go on into Portland as, well, Richland as it was building up. Fountainhead was a much bigger town uh, than Portland was back then. Um, they had like three grocery stores or something like that, you know, and, and it was much bigger than Portland. But anyway, so that's where the, uh, the Masonic building started over there. Next, they... Um, moved to a store 
we're just going to call it the Lanier store because uh, I'm not real sure about whether it was a drug store or a grocery store or what. My great-great-grandfather was Dr. Thomas Luther Lanier, and he was born in 1848 and died in 1934. And he was the one that actually started Consumers Drugs. Uh, it didn't start out being named that, but it was actually his thing at, at first. And he was also in the Masons. He began in the uh, uh, Cherry Mound. Uh, group of Masons. Thomas Luther moved his family into Portland and that's when he started uh, joining the the Masonic Lodge here uh, in Portland and he uh, built the drugstore and started the drugstore business. So then they met with T.L. Lanier in his drugstore. Jay Bailey and Sons erected a two-store building for mercantile purposes in partnership with the Masons and dedicated the upper floor as their meeting hall in November of 1903. And so they met at that place until later on when they moved over to the big building. Well, that building was built in 1909 for the uh, Independent Order of Oddfellas. In 1922, the Lodge voted to change the name from Fountainhead Lodge to Portland Lodge. Uh, there was a vote, and there was 44 voted for it, four voted against it. So it was changed, the name was changed in 1922. My name is James W. Cook. I was uh, introduced to the Portland Lodge by a neighbor that was very much involved with the Portland Lodge and I wanted to pattern my life after someone like Lloyd Brown and Paul Brooks was uh, my mentors. My name is James Daniel Ridge and I've been a Mason since October the 28th, 1957. In 1965, I was alerted for Vietnam, stationed at Seward Air Force Base, Tennessee. Brother Riggs, it gives me great pleasure as a member of Portland Lodge to present to you with this 60-year membership certificate and this pen. I cherish the Lodge and what it means to me. I was raised in December of 49. The worst, worstful master was Brother Herbert Harper. Masonic's always been number one in my mind. I've enjoyed it. I've met a lot of wonderful brothers throughout my career in the service. In the Philippines, they were all military except about three. Mason remains to me there's a bunch of brothers getting together, doing them good work for the community. Uh, I've never seen a time it would, when we were doing work, especially back when uh, Brother Reeser was active. We uh, made food baskets and delivered those baskets at Christmas time. We was always happy and needy, and it learned me to appreciate helping people in need. We know some of the early people that were involved in the lodge. One of them was W.T. McLaughlin, and a lot of people called him Billy McLaughlin. He, he was probably one of the first historians that recorded a lot of information about the history of this area. I would say he was an early entrepreneur. He uh, worked in the strawberry development, and uh, he also was connected with the Bank of Portland, even the Farmer's Bank that's still in existence today. He was also the first uh teacher in Cold Spring School over here that's uh, you know by run by the Highland Rim Historical Society. People have asked me how Richland, it was first Richland Station uh, Portland was and then they changed the 
name from Richland to Portland in 1888. And there are several theories about that. And the one that uh, my cousin Nancy went with here <laughs> is Richland was established August 10, 1859 as a depot for the L&N Railroad. And there was conflict because uh, there was also a Richland in Granger County, Tennessee, and the mail was getting mixed up. And to resolve the conflict on April 10, 1888, the village of Richland was renamed Portland. There was a depot just right in Louisville, Kentucky, um, today where Louisville is. There was a little station there called Portland, Kentucky. And Louisville basically um, um, engulfed this Portland. It, that, that, that station closed down, and it was right on the Ohio River. And, uh, of course, it made sense why it was named Portland, because it was right on the river, and uh, it was a station there, and uh, part of the part of the L N Railroad system. And uh, when that closed, there was no other Portland, so the railroad chose Portland's name from Portland, Kentucky, because that ceased to exist, and then we became Portland, and, and I, one thing they could do, they could actually send things down here from that depot without uh, having an added expense because of Portland, Kentucky. Just delete the mention of Kentucky, and then you have Portland, you have Portland, Tennessee. So that's how Portland actually probably got its name. I'm Dickie Johnson, Grandmaster of Masons in Tennessee. Had the honor of serving in 2009. From the days when uh, people had to walk or ride horseback or go by buggy to lodge to now we can uh, travel uh, pretty quickly to most any lodge in the district. I would recommend Masonry to most anyone. After the Civil War, Tennessee was in terrible physically and financial condition. Uh, however, the Masons came through and many new lodges were started. Some of the soldiers particularly had found good things about masonry during the war, both Union and Southern. And we had an outburst of new lodges. And they came in and did their job, what they do best, helping to reconstruct their communities and their fellows' homes and farms and all the necessary things for life.